you don't need me since I don't have data. Since I'm just using my phone, I might see you. I come home tomorrow. And Bruce is home, right? Yeah. Bruce is home. He didn't come with me. Yeah, no, I saw him working in the yard. I'm wondering. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I well, have fun. <laughs> Bye, Greta. Bye. 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 I'm Bye. taking in historic buildings here. It's so beautiful. Okay. And the regulations are so meaningful here. Okay, bye bye. -bye. Doing outreach. Yeah. Outreach. That's what I'm doing. Uh, so, bye -bye. welcome to this hearing of the Local Historic District Commission. Uh, we uh, are conducting this meeting via remote means, but members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. In person attendance of the members of the public will not be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing will be posted on the town's online calendar. So uh, today's hearing uh, is gonna begin with a review of a proposal that we received from, let's see, where is this? Um, uh, from Beth Eagleston. And Nate, do you wanna talk about that proposal? Do we have anybody here from? Yeah, I guess uh, if you just if um it's a request to modify the garage with a new roof line material, um you know future solar installation, new windows, door, and so possibly some siding. Um, so if there's someone here for the application, could raise their hand, and we'll move you over to a panelist. So Beth Eagleson and her husband Alan Van Geisen are here. Great, thank you for coming, Beth and Alan. Um, we're ready to talk about your project. So would you like to talk to us about it? Sure, so we have a garage in our backyard that is no longer attached to the driveway. The garage was built in the 2000s and we can get into the details of why the driveway is no longer attached, but it has to do with someone not following the permit that they had before. The garage, does not match the house in terms of its roof line and character. And uh, we would like to change the roof line so it is more in line with the architecture of our house and the neighborhood to make it more visually appealing to us and to the people walking down the street. It will remain the same size. We will make it, the, the front will be similar in appearance but change the overhead garage door to a casement window four casement windows, keep the front door and have a sitting area in the front and maintain storage in the back. I think we have some pictures, don't we, Nate? Yeah, I was just getting them ready to share the screen for everyone. So if this is visible, um, here's the existing garage. It's just another image from the from the driveway. So it is visible from the street and the plans are to, um, you know, here's the existing roof line, the dotted line is to raise the roof, change the door and then put in new windows. And then, you know, obviously fix the siding, however that's, if it's necessary. Um, and this is just a little more detail framing plan. Is the plan to keep the same siding that you've got now or, or something different? The plan is to maintain the cedar siding. Obviously, some parts of it might need to be replaced based on the construction, but not to alter the, the majority of the siding. I, I like this plan. I think it's going to be much nicer. Uh, but I'm willing to hear what other people have to say. Do we have yeah, here's the door? Yeah, you know, just the door specification is similar to what's there. Um, Uh, Karen. Uh, I agree with Nancy. I think this is going to be an improvement and um, I congratulate you for this plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We we have been trying to figure out what to do with this garage since we bought the house because it really doesn't match the house or the neighborhood. Steve? I'm just wondering if I could see the sketch again. Um, sure. Yeah.
a sketch. We'll go back to here. Wow, somebody's busy. <laughs> Is that visible for everyone? No, we're looking at your calendar. Wait, you're, you're looking at my calendar? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm keeping track of everything sorry. you're doing. <laughs> Let me do, that's, that's weird. Let me, <laughs> Let me try that again. I put my bank statement on Facebook last week. <laughs> um, yeah, my kids had to tell me that I did it. So is the door going to be solid or is it going to have um, uh, the Is it going to be the same door that you guys have? It'll be similar in appearance. We haven't picked out the door. It may be the one that we have now has a window in it. I yeah, I have now. to comment. This is obviously an improvement, but if you're gonna do, if you're gonna have a war, um, door with multi panes, I was just wondering if you could maybe, you know, for your windows, do four over one or something to match. Um, is that more expensive, or is that too obtrusive? Or we um, picked instead of the yeah. overhead door, we will have four casement windows. Is that mm -hmm. what you're talking about? Yeah, no, I was just wondering if if um, if you're doing one over one in terms of panes. I was just wondering if, yeah. if you're having a door with multi you know this is quibbling and it's not i'm just suggesting it and if it's not to your taste i'm certainly no, uh, so you're saying here i'll, I'll annotate this right so yeah, if you did something yeah. like you know four over one oh oh yeah yeah i think we would totally make the match yeah okay yeah. that's all my, yeah. that's my only comment particularly, yeah particularly if you're going to have windows uh on your door it'd be nice to have that match or if you're not going to you know anyway there's a yeah. lot of multi pain you know four over ones in the neighborhood so um you know preferably i would you know as an aesthetic thing would like a four over one. Yeah, I think that we would we would definitely do that. We would certainly make them match. Okay, great. Thanks. Nicole? Um, I guess that was similar uh comment as well, because um a garage door, you know, it's kind of now more of a little a little house or a little <laughs> a little addition. Um so like if the it was more about the aesthetics of the window and the door. Like if that was going to be um, the same style as the house, because we don't have pictures of that. I think we would match it to the house. Yeah. I mean, part of our issue with the garage is that it doesn't match the house at all right now. And so I think we would do everything we can to, you know, match the windows. We're trying to match the roof line. We'll match the, the, um, the shingles on the roof. Um, so yeah, I think we would we would match the house, which looks like we all have um, all of our windows are just split down the middle. Um, so they're like, what two point you know two two over two Is that, would that right. be what yeah. you call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think we would try to match that. I mean, at the very least, least we would make the the windows and the door of the garage match each other. Oh yeah, you can kind of see the windows of the house now. On that right page. here, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was zoomed in. All right, yeah. That's see, good. see. I think you have your hand. Is your hand raised again? Me? Yeah. No, no. I think you oh, just okay. need to lower it. I'm yeah. just incompetent. Yeah. Do we have any other comments or concerns about this project? Well, I think what we've seen, we've all see as a an improvement, and we're pleased to see you fixing up your garage. Uh, and keeping it historically, trying to make it more historically appropriate. So uh, let's take a vote on approving this project. Um, Karen? Uh, would there, before that, would there be any, you know, would we want to put a condition or something in the motion about matching the doors and windows to them to each other on the garage or matching the house? I feel like that's one of the things that was discussed. I'm not sure if anyone wants to make that a condition of the, of the motion. Um. Uh, I'll move to make, uh, you know, to have it be that the windows match um, the design of the main house as a condition. Uh, it looks like we have another person who's from the public who's raised her hand, Kana Ennis. Sure. How you can unmute yourself? Great, thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. So I'm just wondering why there has to be a condition about the style of the windows um, when that's clearly been stated by the homeowners, if that is their intention to make things match their home. It sounds seems like 
a relatively honestly invasive space for a historic commission to make a motion and make their their project conditional upon that if no, that's, their plan sure. is in, in keeping with the neighborhood as is uh indicated it actually isn't um it's a pretty customary thing it's not mandatory as far as i'm concerned but I, we would prefer and it actually um is not invasive and it's actually a pretty common thing in, in in um local historic districts i understand and i live in the, i live in the the district as well and i just you know i'm concerned about that as a particular condition of this when it's already been stated and understood in a building that was constructed after the year 2000 which is clearly not a historic time period um so, yeah so quickly yeah i'm nate a, a planner with the town so it's actually common practice to say to take what an applicant says and make it a condition because what they say in this hearing is not enforceable. It's only enforceable if it's a condition and is voted on by the commission. So last night at the planning board hearing, an applicant said they would move their mini split, exterior mini split to some location. And, you know, the only way to actually make that enforceable is to ha have that be a condition of a permit. And so it's really customary to take things like this and make them conditions. And so, especially in the local historic district commission, it's about aesthetics. And so the commission regulates, you know, the style of doors, windows, siding. And so I think these conditions are really appropriate. Um, you know, if it's if it's a financial hardship for an applicant, then they can say something. But in terms of being invasive, this is actually something the local historic district is uh, designed to do is to actually regulate things like window patterns, wheel patterns, and exterior appearance. So yeah, and I'll just add that uh, this is not meant to suggest we don't trust uh, the exactly. applicant. If they already said uh, they're going to do that, then why is there like a, yeah. you know, a shackle put upon them as they design? Because that's, that's the way it needs to work yeah. so that we get what they say they'll do. Fascinating. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Karin? Um, can you hear me? Am I on? Yes. Yep. Okay. I, I kind of understand that if they run into difficulties uh, with the windows matching exactly, do they have to come back? I mean, I do think that the whole purpose of this whole construction is to make it more aesthetically pleasing. So um, I, I, I agree, maybe we should just say we approve this instead of putting that condition on because the condition, I mean, they could run into some sort of thing. Does this really match? Do the windows really match? And it's clear that the desire is to make this uh, attractive. So I, I understand that um, the person that that from who called in saying, isn't this getting a little uh, intrusive? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, yeah. well. Uh, I, I agree that uh, given that both Beth and Alan immediately said that that was their intention was to make things match. Uh, I've watched a previous renovation they did to their house, which came out quite beautiful. And so I'm inclined to trust them, but um, I'll understand if other people feel differently. Uh, Steve, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, no, I mean, I, um, it's just that it's going to happen now, we might as well, it, it's a little thing, but I think it's would improve, uh, it's an improvement and getting two over one window, that's a pretty standard, it's not a, you know, if it is a financial hardship, of course, uh, you know, I don't think it should be a condition, but they're pretty standard windows. There's another building on McClellan that went up, they, and some of the windows don't match, and like, you know, I didn't want to make a big deal about it, but it would have been better they and they didn't come up before us but the windows are actually inconsistent within the house itself most of the windows are four over one and then on the second floor there's a bunch of windows that are two it doesn't make any sense i actually would prefer to you know particularly since the homeowners say that it's not a problem to make it a condition because i do think it's incrementally you know you know i think they'll an improvement over just you know modern windows so Steve, are you moving that we included in the- I would like to still, I'm just countering Karen. I mean, I'm not, if it's a financial hardship, uh, you know, I, like Nate says, I think I would prefer to have it as a condition myself. All right, then I think we have a motion that this be part of the condition. If for some reason this is a financial hardship, 
I think the committee would be willing to uh, adjust accordingly, but um, I think that you, you do have to bring something back to us if you find you can't do what we've asked. Um, so do I have a second for that motion? I second the motion. Okay, well, let's take a vote then. Um, Nicole? Aye. Uh, Betty? Steve? Uh, yes. Karen? Yes. Elizabeth, you were muted. I just want to make sure we heard what you... Aye. And I support this also. So uh, we will be granting your certificate uh, of appropriateness. And thank you very much for coming to the meeting and, and discussing this project with us. Of course. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, so the next thing on our agenda is to discuss East Amherst as a potential historic district. And Steve has done some research to find uh, someone who could do some of the research for us. Um, yeah, so do you want to talk I'll about that, a, Steve? Sure, I'll give a quick report. I contacted Hattie Startup and asked her if we could, you know, if she would be interested, you know, in doing the research for a fee. And she actually said that she wasn't. So then I actually went back and I researched the name of the architectural firm that did such a great job in 2014, which is, Nate was right, they're based in Portland, Maine. And so I contacted um, somebody there and the firm has disbanded. Oh. And so the guy was really nice. Uh, one of the principals of his own firm. So he sent me a list of historic preservation consultants. And Jeff Mellish, who was the guy that did such a great job, was listed on it. So I called up a, a firm that's based in Maynard, Massachusetts. But Jeff doesn't work there anymore. But I talked to somebody, um, Elizabeth Warburton, and uh, sent her, gave her access to the Dropbox, and, that, and she said it was going to be a problem. And then two days ago, you know, I told her that we were going to have a meeting. I contacted her on Tuesday, and she just flaked and just said that um, they decided it wasn't enough. Ten thousand dollars wasn't enough money for them, so they kind of put me in a in a spot. So then I went back to the historic preservation consultant list, and I saw that Chris Skelly is on it, which is like amazing because, as I said before, Chris Skelly used to be the head of the Massachusetts Historical Commission. He lives in Shelburne. I mean, it, you know, there's nobody that knows more. So I actually called him on the phone and asked him as a favor uh, because the CPA, uh, oh, by the way, I finished the CPA application. I just haven't submitted it yet. But um, the application's due um, the 30th. So I asked Chris if he could c come up with an estimate very quickly that I could present to you guys. And I told him, um, I can't get over how much money it is. I mean, I told him I actually reduced it to 25 properties that he would have to research because in my estimation, like 10 are already done and another 10 are like halfway done. And, you know, I figured that between us, we could, you know, or I could do it. And so um, he came back to me with $12,000, which is $2,000 more, which comes out to $500 um, per Form B. Um, which seems like a lot to me, but maybe it isn't because the other firm, May, May, uh, Maynard, didn't wouldn't even give me an estimate. So um, I guess I'm assuming that's what it would cost. I I, know, I also contacted the guy that um, who helped us on the North Prospect Lincoln Sunset, and he said he would be interested, uh, Sean McWilliams, and I'm going to meet with him in the next week or so. But at least I, I think we need a budget for uh, to submit. The CPA application. So this is what we have. So Steve, you need approval of the committee to submit this, or what? What do you? What do you need? Well, two things. I just wanted to yeah. To well, last I can't print out the, the CPA form is actually kind of weird. I can't print it out, and it's actually a very unuser friendly form. It has little tiny spaces, um, so you can't even see what you're actually cutting and pasting. So I can't present. Last time we. Um, at our last meeting, you guys had voted. We had voted for me to present the CPA application, and unfortunately, I'm not capable of showing it to you. But it's been finished. I just have to submit it and with the budget. But I did want to just bring the budget to your attention. It's more than what we had been talking about, um, but it's the best I can do, and there, there is a deadline. 
So I just wanted everybody to sign off on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Steve, um, I mean, I think we could extrapolate from um, Chris's proposal and say, if it is, you know, 480 or $500, say $500 of property for, for inventory form, I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, we could say go for 20,000 or 15,000 just so, um, you know, the CPA committee can always ask to reduce it, right? But I, I, I just, you know, um, you know, the I... CPA. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nate. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know, the CPA pot might be nine hundred thousand, right? A million, one point two million, and so I feel like we could say twenty thousand, and not, you know, whatever it ends up being. If we really, if we really have forty properties, or forty five, and and we wanted to get all new forms, I mean, I don't mind putting in a proposal for, you know, twenty two thousand or whatever it takes, and then they can question it, and we could say, okay, well, maybe we'll have volunteers and we can do less. But I just, um, if we're gonna go for it, I don't mind having. Okay. So should I write? Should I call them back and just tell them to revise and send me a new budget? I mean, it could just be that he changes like the two, the twenty-five to whatever properties, and then the the fee would change. I mean, it could be really. Well, no, it says twelve thousand dollars. I I can call him up. You believe me, he'll be happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but are you guys all? Um, Elizabeth has her hand up. Yeah, I'd like to hear what Elizabeth has to say. Um, I would just uh, suggest that you. Go for what you need. Go for what you want to get the whole thing done. There's nothing worse than getting three quarters of the way through it with an, with some money and then not being able to finish it out in the way you want. And it may be that at the end we decide that some of those other properties don't become part of the historic district, but at least you'll have the form Bs on them. And, you know, kind of like once you're in the research, it's kind of easier to keep going than to add on somebody else into the project. So I'd go for the whole amount of what exactly you need, just echoing what Nate said. That sounds like good advice. Nicole. And I was just gonna add, you know, if if there are volunteers that do stuff between now and then, you don't we don't have to take all the money, right? I mean, we can say we only need no, 10, take all 15 the money. of it. <laughs> Nobody ever returns money, but like <laughs> I said, um, I, I created Form B, digital Form Bs for all the properties in the National Historic District. I did not include some of the other ones. I'm just assuming that we're going to do, you know, the Dickinson um, LHD, they didn't even do Form B. They just submitted um, the National Historic District as their application. So we did them. Um, but anyway, I've created, the, the, some of them are already done, but I'll put $20,000 down there. Um, uh, you know, uh, I was actually felt kind of sheepish coming back with 12 because we only got five for the um, for the Lincoln Sunset. But the difference is, and I've been thinking a lot about it, it was Lincoln Sunset because it was generated from the neighborhood itself. People were very motivated and they did a lot of volunteer work. And I, I just don't see because this is more abstract. Um, uh, I, so I think it's better to subcontract it. So I'm going to go back and and uh make it for twenty thousand dollars yeah i think you know some of the case you could make steve uh for the funding is also that they're older homes and so the deed research may have to be done in person at the registry okay. uh, so it's not you know it's not capable of being done all online and so there's you know it will take more kind of active research whether that's a special collections or the registry or other things so. okay um yeah, okay, so I'll just do that, and then I'll, I'm going to ask him to do another. I'm not going to present it to you. I'm just going to get another uh, another bid from him, and then I'm going to submit the um, submit the application if everyone's cool, okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for your work on that, Steve. It's really great. Uh, Nicole, did you have something else to say, or is your hand still up from before? Yeah, no, it's actually more imperative now because um, they're proposing a um, – you know, and I think it's right on East Amherst on College Street. Um, what do you call them? A lay, um, an overlay zone. An overlay zone. So the and with the, between that and the school, it's going to be a lot of pressure on the on this uh, area. So um, that's what I put in the application. But the other thing is, now that Elizabeth is with us, um, uh, should I tell Chris? Are you guys going to put Elizabeth? It turns out that Chris. Skelly, he used to be the head of the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and he lives in Shelburne, so it's up, you know, very close to here. He specializes in divide, um, doing uh, design guidelines, historic design guidelines. So 
uh, and he was really interested in doing it. So, Nate, what do I? T how does the bid? Oh, what do I tell him about that? Yeah, I mean, the design guidelines that the town's looking for is downtown. It's not, you know, necessarily specific to a local historic district, but um, it'll become public. I mean, I'm assuming he can see it. He'll, you know, it'll um, go out through different state online uh, platforms. I'm assuming he's registered with, like, say, the Goods and Services Bulletin or certain things, so he would be notified of it. Can you give me a heads up so I can give him a heads up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, he yeah, said I mean, I think... it was really complicated. But... Interesting, yeah. And he said it was their downtown as well. So Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah he and may he have worked with a... Oh, sorry, okay. I was saying he may have worked with a team. So even, um, okay. we like this one, there's an architecture firm out of, um, uh, is it maybe Watertown, but they're small and they've done a few really nice design guidelines yes. um, around, town, around the state. And uh, they usually end up working in a team, right? So the architect will be the lead, but they end up, you know, working, pulling in a number of different private consultants. And so maybe Chris will, you know, he can do that as well. Okay. Now he's, I, I mean, we worked with him on the, on the other one and he was terrific. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, that's my two things. Steve, do you need anybody else to look at this uh, proposal before you submit it? Do you want anyone else to look at it? I don't even know how you go online and, you know, you put, um, it's an existing account and then you can save work in progress. But it's pretty pretty straightforward, and I okay. actually took a lot of. Um, I did a CPA grant for the last LHD, so I took a lot of the answers from there and just updated them. And then I just did a very short overview of the actual properties. Um, God, did you know that at that tavern, um, the Dickinson Bags Tavern, they actually plotted Shay's Rebellion there? Does anyone know what Shay's Rebellion is? <laughs> Yeah, anyway, no, that Shady Rebellion was a pretty big deal. It was um, almost like the Tea Party now. Mm -hmm. And it actually, people died. It was, it was in Pelham, Daniel Shea. Uh, yeah. Was, I, yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a different tavern. It near was a there. clap tavern, but they moved the clap tavern to the, you're like way ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The clap tavern was where it actually took place, but the clap tavern, the building was moved to the to where the Dickinson uh, one is now, and then renamed. So it's oh. the same structure with a new name, but that you know. And anyway, it's pretty interesting. Some of the people, like General, there's a General Mattoon. Have you ever heard of him? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, the his, house is. Yeah, his house is there. He was a congressman and a Revolutionary War general. Anyway, the, you know, the more I dig into it, the more um, uh, mean. You know, I think it's definitely worth doing so yeah that's great it's really good uh what, what else do we want to discuss about making east Amherst potential historic district do we have other things we need to talk about no i mean i, I agree i mean the planning board um met last night and they've been meeting to look at east amherst as the potential you know redevelopment area along route nine and so um, you know, anywhere from like the railroad bridge by Hampshaw Lumber all the way down to like Stanley Street. Um, and one of the members last night said, oh, would we ever go north along the common? And it was kind of interesting because right now it's um, um, zoned RVC, Residential Village Center. And I don't necessarily see, I mean, the, I thought that member of the planning board and others have said they like the character of way, you know, say north of Route 9, the way it looks right now around the common. And so I'm not sure why we necessarily want to rezone it to allow redevelopment. Um, so I like the idea of a local historic district here. And I like the idea of redeveloping Route 9 and having some two distinct areas. So I don't know. I, don't know. That's, I guess that's for people, that's for the planning board to talk about as well. <laughs> OK, Karen, we'll, we'll expect you to do that part. Uh, so we move to uh, amending the bylaw to include a review of the parking lots and other structures. Yeah, that's still on me. I haven't I haven't done much with it. I, I talk about it. Um, I have text. I just need to um, kind of move it forward. Um, luckily, the you know ninety eight fearing is a project that had been coming um, before the commission, and they've been really slow to provide new information. And so I'm not sure when that will actually come back. I think they're watching. There's a ZBA case up on North Pleasant Street where someone's trying to add a second duplex on a property and it's um, getting a lot of resistance from the neighbors. And so they might be waiting to see kind of how that works. But I still think we can regulate parking 
and other things now. Uh, I think that what we're hoping to do is just clarify it so that it's really not, you know, an interpretation of the building commissioner. So, um, you know, we can't regulate the use, but we can regulate the space, you know, the parking space. So can you bring us some uh, language mm -hmm. to vote yeah. on at our next gathering? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be great. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, I wondered if, um, you know, before we get to that, and I know you don't have a firm proposal, but would you say a little bit about why you think it's important to regulate the parking and the other facilities? What in general is the reason for that? Yeah, so I think, you know, right now in our bylaw, we follow the state template and we said that um, a structure is defined as anything other than a building and it could be, um, you know, uh, like a shed, a, um, you know, like a, a sign. And then um, further in the bylaw, we have exemptions and we say that anything that's a structure that's substantially a grade is exempt, but other other things aren't. And so, um, so for two things, one is um, uh, what we're seeing now with a lot of infill is they you have, they have to treat stormwater on site. And so they're essentially creating a stormwater structure out of earth or pipes that's quite visible. And so, um, you know, even in Valley CDC's project on Northampton Road right now, you know, the 28 units affordable housing, I think it's a nice project, but out in the front yard, they have a detention area and there's a concrete overflow structure and there's grading and essentially it's no longer at grade. And so, you know, one of the changes was to include drainage or utility infrastructure. Um, and, and I think it's defined, you know, the building commissioner thinks that it's already captured under the definition, but it'd be great to have just that clarity because, you know, you could have um, a new building in the local historic district where they have to treat stormwater on site. And then they propose to have, you know, this concrete overflow structure in the front yard, mm -hmm. for instance, right? And then, um, so that's one. And then in terms of parking, we can't regulate use, but we can regulate the space. And so it's a little different, but, you know, I think it's really um, kind of, it's unique to Amherst because there is this conversion of single family homes to a different use, right? To rentals. And so with that comes parking. And so I think most local historic districts probably don't have to be concerned with, you know, a two fam a two unit, two family building, right? In Amherst, that might just be, a, you know, a few cars. I mean, outside of Amherst might be a few cars. In Amherst, if it's two units with four bedrooms each, that's eight cars and that becomes a parking lot. And mm. so it, it changes the residential character of a of the district. And so, you know, the language we've been looking at with the building commissioner is regulating parking um, that's over so many square feet or so many parking spaces. And so the commission would have the ability to say, well, you have to move that behind a building. It can't be, mm. you know, in the front of the building or something. And so that's, you know, and that's where it also becomes important. Um, you don't want to see of asphalt maybe along the whole side of a property. And so, you know, right now, um, I think the commission can regulate it. Say, for instance, that if there's a proposal to have multiple buildings on a property and they want to have this big parking lot, the commission could say, well, your parking lot's informing where your buildings are located, but we want to move things around to make it more aesthetic, right, in terms of setbacks or other things. But if someone just came in right now and said, well, I want to just pave my, my yard, there's really nothing to regulate that. Um, so, you know, I, I do think it's, you know, I think local historic districts and other communities might not have to worry about that. But in Amherst, it just seems like it's because of this, um, the pressure on the housing market, and it's, you know, kind of this drive for people to create infill and change the number of units on a property. I think that's really why it's relevant. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, Bruce Coldham said it. Uh, I mean, I was surprised. Yeah. He, 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 he's, I wasn't sure, you know, it's like a few meetings ago and he's like, yeah, I actually think Amherst is in a unique position and we should because of this interpretation of the bylaw to allow multiple dwellings or structures on a property. And so with that comes parking. And so, you know, we're seeing there's one proposal for two duplexes on a property and they want to have 10 or 12 parking spaces. Mm. And that's, it's not, um, you know, it's not a local historic district or anything. And it, you know, the property's big, but it's like, wow, that's, you know, 12 parking spaces with a turnaround and Everything. It's a lot of. That's a. That's a, par that's a parking lot. <laughs> so can we expedite this since it's coming up? It's going to yeah. Be like, like I said, I think we're. Um, I think we're within the bylaw to regulate it now. I think the adding it just can make it a little clearer. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think we should. I was waiting. Like I said, the attorneys were. Um, were hoping to update the whole general bylaw. This fall, and this was going to be like folded into it. So I. I, I 
I'll um, try to follow up with that to see if we can. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I, I it's on my list. I um, like I said, I have draft language with the building commissioner, and we just need to kind of work it out a little bit. Hey, we saw your calendar, so you don't have to explain. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, let me tell you it's getting busy usually it, it's okay but uh, this fall right now we um crazy you know, this, it's between you know the historical commission is really busy and then the housing trust and the planning board and block grants kicking up again it's just like oh all right here we go <laughs> <laughs> but you have a new person though, right they can help you out uh, uh rob staffs the zoning board but we never mm -hmm. filled ben's position so i'm still mm -hmm. oh, okay doing much He's of his role on his own okay yeah, we've we've tried to hire, and our a few applicants have withdrawn. It's been somewhat disappointing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, have we yeah. got unanticipated items? Uh, Nicole, um, I just wanted to kind of update you because Nate and I, over this yeah. last couple of weeks since um, our last meeting, two houses have come on the market that were are in um, the district. So um, 18 North Prospect, the listing agent was like totally on top of everything and everything about the local historic district was loaded in the MLS. So I can see it and I'm like, I just let Nate know that that was all good. But um, 80 Fearing is for sale by owner. So there was kind of no information <laughs> about the local historic district um, as there's not a realtor that's kind of updating the documents and making those documents available. Um, so I had kind of left it in your hands, Nate, and I just wanted to kind of see moving forward if this is the best way, like for me to just highlight to you, I saw this house come on the market. Like, is it something that's going to come from the town? of saying, you know, please inform any buyers <laughs> that you're located in the local historic district. Like, I think it's one thing, um, I'm happy to do it either way. Um, but obviously with that other property, it, with the listing agent, you know, I could just say from a listing agent to a listing agent, here you go. Um, and that's typically, you know, they are going to be with the listing agent, but for the for sale by owner. Um, anyways, so I'm just kind of like throwing that back at you, Nate. Yeah, I think with listing agents, I think it'd be great if you could, um, you know, the town doesn't follow the sales. We typically follow it after the fact. And so yeah. we just don't know, you know, the assessors will see it after the fact. We'll only get involved if a potential buyer or the seller has questions and, you know, there's an attorney. So no, I really appreciate that you reached out. And so I, I you know, what we did was there's a, it's a, it's a little dated, but there's a flyer, an informational flyer. And it's great just to have that to distribute so that the owners can see, see that. And I mean, you know, I am surprised sometimes that people will purchase a property and then say, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that it was either in a historic district or that it's historic or something mm -hmm. else, you know, just any, anything really, right? Like, oh, <laughs> oh, there's a easement across my backyard. It's like, didn't someone do title on you for you or help you? And so, um, but yeah, no, I, I yeah, I don't want to put it on us, but if you ever see something for sale by owner or something that doesn't have a, an agent, I think that'd be great to let us know. And then we can you know, try to figure out how, you know, how to, make it be more public and everyone be aware of it yeah i mean even if there's just like a standard letter or something i mean right. like i mentioned before like it's right. a buyer beware state so sellers don't actually have to disclose anything it's not their responsibility it's the buyer's responsibility to know these things mm -hmm. or find out these things <laughs> research these yeah. things <laughs> um yeah so you know it it obviously just comes across differently. Like as a, as a realtor, they're going to know right. I live in Amherst. I'm checking what's for sale in Amherst every day. Um, so it, it, it wouldn't be, you know, as odd for me to reach out to another listing agent and say, by the right. way, you know, I'm on this commission and I saw that the, your house just came up. We, as the commissioners would, you know, love for you to share this information just to help the buyers. Right. Actually, if I know that you're saying that it just made me realize um, yeah, because of that, right? Um, and we had talked about this. I'll, I'll, let me just make a note. I will circle back with the assessor. Uh, we I, we were trying to add this to a field, um, but I don't see it on the property card. Um, oh, that would be nice. Yeah, and it might be on an internal one, but not a public facing one. Yeah. 
Yeah, because mm -hmm. typically realtors will pull up the property card. Right, right. So if a yeah. realtor for a for a buyer were to look at the property, they would see it then. If it's added, he's saying it might not be there. Yeah, it might not be there. Yeah. And we talked about that. There was a few we we were trying to um that was a while ago actually. So I yeah, we were trying to get that added in a few things just so that you know, because it is all it's all public, it'd be great to have some of this so it's not right, this hidden information like, oh, I didn't know it was in a historic district. And there was a, we were trying to add um oh, there's one other thing um I wanted to add to the property cards. Anyways, I it it's just to me it's just like good record keeping to have that be somewhere in a central place like the assessor's information. And I know they have it, so it's just a matter of how does it get displayed on the card. Well, thank you yeah. for bringing that to our attention, Nicole. That was very helpful. Yeah, um, I, I like that idea. Do we have a public comment from anyone? No, there were three attendees. Someone had called and said they might attend this meeting, but I didn't see their name in the list and they all left after the hearing, so. Okay. Um, no, shall we um, Karen, speak? No, Karen has her hand up. Oh, Karen? So I'm wondering if, if this is uh, awkward for Nicole as a realtor, but it's important somehow to um, to make the owner aware that this is, that he doesn't have to, but this would be good to, to inform the buyers. Should we take it upon ourselves so if we are informed by Nicole that this is um, happening to drop off one of these or is the town going to do it just to get the ball rolling I mean we as a commission could take it on us just to drop off this and make it be known you mean the flyers the flyer mm -hmm. well I think we're good for now I think it's really about how we manage it moving forward and so you know um, giving it to the owner they might not provide it so I think I like the angle of trying to get it on a property card and then, you know, if there is an agent, I, you know, I don't want to put Nicole in an awkward spot, but you know, she no. sees that she sees that in a way that I don't, um, you know, and so, um, but yeah, I mean, we used to send out an annual mailing to property owners, but they still say that they didn't know or they don't want to disclose it. And so it's one of those things that's really hard to make it available to the potential buyers is really who are trying to, you know, educate, not necessarily the owners. And so it's a, um, that's where the property card I think would be helpful just so it's it's right up there. I agree uh, that's in the in the future that should be done. But for right now, should we in the meantime just drop off a flyer again? To AD Fearing? Yeah. Right. Somebody will contact them for sure, Aaron. I'm sure Jennifer will be there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a you're like it's a very valid concern we need to get, get moving on that i mean i think i think one of my thoughts was and again like we have no control over what the seller does with it but yeah like if a letter came from the town with that flyer of saying we noticed your house on the market please share this with all buyers um like it's out of your control as to what they do with it but at least you know then the best effort was made i i just feel like directly to the i mean i'm happy to send send the letter um right. i'm just wondering like having it come from the town it just right, seemed right. a little less of a nosy neighbor versus <laughs> this is a town thing <laughs> that seems right to me steve oh i yeah this is a different thing but what about getting some signs for some of these districts so people even though they exist? You That's know, most of the idea. other towns have signs for national registry districts, which aren't even local historic districts. Um, you know, like Sunderland has one, Hadley has one, um, Hatfield has a couple of them. I mean, should we start thinking about that? I know that the new um, on Hazel Avenue, which is the African American district. There actually are signs up now um, saying that it is. So should maybe, should we start thinking about, uh, I would even do a fundraiser to make the signs, but you're putting some signs up so people are even aware. And that's a good way to bring awareness. If you pass a sign and it says it's a, you know, a local historic district, then, you know, 
there's no surprises. You know, just an idea. It's, it's great. It's literally, buyers going to the open house are going to read that as they're driving yeah. up the sign. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, we let's let, we can make that a future agenda item. I mean, years ago, the commission, historical commission, wanted it, and then they got bogged down by the design of it. Um, I know the Hazel, or the I think that's considered. Um, it's not West. Is it West Side um, Historic District? I know they were talking about it. So I think Steve would be. I think yeah, it's something we should have. We could continue and. Um, and it had been mentioned that it's something that would be done. So I, I feel like. They have really nice ones at Hazel. They, they're street zone. I mean, they're part of the street zone. Yeah. Yeah. But I just read there all those, pro like yesterday in the paper, four of those properties were just sold to the same person. So I hope those buildings, I mean, I guess it sounds like someone's going to put up a big building. I don't know if you noticed that. No, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. Because that neighborhood isn't, I didn't even know that thing was, I didn't even know that street was there. It's right. Fast. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. If somebody bought four include that in your hundred. in your proposal, your twenty thousand dollar proposal. We'd like some signs. <laughs> no, it's a shame they're shanties, but it's it's a fascinating street. It's a dead end street right behind the track, the Amherst College track. I had Thank no you. idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Let's talk about signs. I made a note to myself, and I think it's probably you know we have the wayfinding system up. We kind of have, you know, I feel like we have a good template. We know like the style, the, and so we could just adapt it to have, you know, so many entry signs to these districts. It's, I think that's a great suggestion. I, I agree. Go ahead. Elizabeth. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what that Hazel Street is zoned. So if someone bought four properties, what does that mean they could do? Yeah, I mean it's it's um it's just general um neighborhood residents. And so, you know, it might just they they were they had been owned actually by not by one family too for a while. And so maybe that they just all transferred all the ownership. Maybe they just uh, you know, I I'll look into it. Um, you know, they're rentals okay. right now, so maybe they're just considering keeping it that way. Um, I actually haven't heard any anything um, happening down there, but um, they're not. There's not too much they can do. Um, I'm just looking at the lots are kind of small, and they have already some pretty big buildings on two. So I don't. Yeah. Are you considering it could be a site for a local historic district because of its um, history, that whole neighborhood? The the houses are in must have been very inexpensive to build and are not in great shape. So I'm not sure what we could enforce there. Well, they sold, those three houses sold one for 265, one for 482, and one for 505. Whoa, really? Yeah. Well, these, see, these are student rentals now. Uh, well, one, so. I think one is considered a three family, so. So that three family went for 723. Wow. Yeah, something's up. Hazel, 723. Yeah, I that mean, you know, the, but apartment, time. apartments, townhouses, that types of things aren't allowed in that district. So it could just be oh. that they're, you know, I don't know, maybe that they would just, you know, try to maximize the number of tenants they could have. Um, yeah, I well, so signs. Let's we'll, we'll have that next time. I do like that idea, and we, I'll take some pictures. And we had a previous. I mean, we had kind of had a template marked up. I thought that, um, so we could just kind of resurrect that. Great. Other items that people would like to bring forward. I was going to say for the we can schedule the next meeting. There's three applications that'll probably be reviewed. There. Okay. Similar to today in, in the respect that I don't I don't think they're um, too complicated, but um, they do have to go through the process. And so, um, you know, one's two, well, two are fences and one's a deck. And so, um, so I was looking at the week of October 23rd, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is the 23rd a possibility for people? It's a Monday afternoon. Yeah, that, that's good with me. 
Yep. Works for me. Three o'clock, as usual. Yes. Time. If that's good, yep. that gives me enough time to get the legal ad posted and everything. Yeah, that works. And I was just going to add kind of to that conversation, um, just so that it's not reliant on, you know, the family members, or not family members, but the commission knowing the people and the individuals. You know, I do, I do think it is best to kind of just have it written up so that there is no judgment on, you know, it happens to be a landlord and you, you know, the, the neighbors don't know this person at all because they live in Boston, <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, that whole like not trusting the landlord to do it versus the homeowner to do it or, you know, something like that. I think it is just better whatever we do consistently to, you know, okay, great. You said that. Great. We're going to just write it up as such or or whatever else just so it's in writing and it doesn't have anything to do with you know what that person's been like before or even if we know them or don't know them i agree yeah. how do you, but how do you do it i mean um well i think yeah. that this was handled well it was just said great you said it was going to be similar to the house and let's write it up as such versus okay. you know the pressure of not writing it and let's see what happens i just think it's better for us to be consistent with having it written um just because you know we have had kind of non-local landlords you know presenting such where there's not a relationship yeah no i agree i think you know we've had an attorney do some trainings and she said whenever an applicant says they're going to do something you just make it a condition i mean it's just standard practice and so you know i think the other homeowner uh, who spoke, maybe they were just concerned. I think they did feel like it was invasive, but to me, it's just, it's, it's common practice. And the point of the district is to regulate these things. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm really comfortable um, saying that. And I think, you know, it's not an onerous condition to have a grill style on a window. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, people, uh, someone's, you know, wants to do a 30,000, $40,000 addition on their house and they complain about like a $300 fee. And it's like, well, you know, you're planning to spend tens of thousands of dollars, but you're not going to spend a few hundred here and do something. And so, um, but I, I think they, I mean, I agreed. I think their property's nice and I think they'll do it, but we can't take them on their word and not take someone else. And, and really it doesn't become any, there's no action there. If it's not recorded on the permit or the certificate, there's no way to document it. So yeah, yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I, I think it was the right thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. I think Nicole's like suggesting some sort of protocol in terms of informing people when they put their houses up and um, some sort of mechanism. Isn't that what you're trying to suggest? Or am I missing something? Um, no, those were two different items, but okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, two different items. Okay. But yeah, for the people, I am going to talk to the assessor to see if we can make it public on property cards that the properties in a local historic district. And we had talked about that um, a while ago. Um, and so, you know, just as we say not owner occupied on it, we could just, I mean, it could just go in the notes. I'd love it to be its own field and just say, you know, located in a local historic district and then. Yes or no. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Especially as we expand to new districts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So uh, Nate, for the, for Greta and Bruce, do you let them know when the next meeting is going to be, or do I need to let them know? How do I'll we send an talk? email out um, maybe tomorrow and just say, you know, okay. here's the next meeting, and we're probably expecting a few um, few applications, and then we can have you know other topics to review. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, well, then, do we have a motion to adjourn? I so move. Second. I second. <laughs> okay. uh, all in favor? See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Great. Bye. Okay. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay. you, Nick. Thank you. Mate. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.